Greetings and welcome to the first episode of PHS Physics SOS. Today I will be going over the homework problems for the first part of chapter 2, uh, starting with question number 3 on page 47 of your textbook. Uh, question number 3 says, uh, right here, it says, Figure 2.7 shows the position time graphs of the straight line movement of two brown bears in a wildlife preserve. Which bear has the greater average velocity over the entire period? So, to find out the greatest average velocity, average velocity is change in distance over change in time. So to figure out which bear has the greatest average velocity, we have to look at the change in distance over the ch change in time of bear A, and the change in distance over the change in time for bear B. And this symbol here, uh, this little triangle, is a delta. And it means change in. So we look at bear A, and then it looks like he's moved about, let's see, at t equals 60 minutes, he's moved about 1600 meters. And if we look at bear B, he's moved about 2,600, uh, 2,700 meters. So, delta X for bear A is going to equal, what do we say, about 1,600 meters. And delta X for bear B is going to equal about 2,700 meters. So, and these are equal to average velocity. So the average velocity for bear A is going to equal this. So we have 1600 meters over our total time, which is 60 minutes. And our average velocity for bear B is going to equal 2700 over 60. And if you go ahead and plug those into your calculator, you will get 1600 over 60 equals 26.7. And wrote those too close. And 2700 over 60 equals 45. And of course, we need units. These are both going to be in meters per minute whoops meters per minute um I hope that's not cut off yeah okay um so now that was a lot of work and we figured out that the average velocity for bear b is greater it's 45 versus 26.7 because he traveled more distance um his uh change in distance over change in time was greater. But there's an easier way to do that because we know that they both uh, took 60 minutes and so we can just look at, I mean since we know the bottom of the fraction is the same, the delta t is both going to be 60 minutes, we can just look at the change in position to figure out which one had a greater average velocity. So that, uh, so all we'd have to do is look over here and say well that's 1600, that's 2700, boom, bear b has greater average velocity. Quick and simple. The next part of the question asks which bear has a greater average velocity at t equals 10 minutes. And since we know e uh, velocity equals uh, change in distance over change in time, the, uh, the velocity for the bears is going to be the slope of these graphs. So we have to look at the slope of the two graphs at time equals 10 minutes. And we just have to, you just have to look at it and approximate. But you can use something like a pencil or, in my case, a zip tie because it was sitting on my desk to figure out about what the velocity is. So at, at t equals 10 minutes we just put it about tangent to the graph and it looks pretty steep. Doesn't that look pretty steep? And then if you bring it over to bear b it's pretty shallow. Maybe a little steeper than that. But either way it's pretty shallow. So you can say that bear a has a greater velocity at t equals 10 minutes because the slope of the graph of its position is greater than the slope of the graph of bear b's position at t equals 10 minutes. 
The next part of the question asks, is the velocity of bear A always positive? So we go back to our definition of velocity, which is change in distance over change in time. And we look at, so what would make this negative? Well, we know the change in time can never be negative. You can't go backwards in time. So for this to be less than zero, the change in position has to be negative. In other words, delta x over some time interval over some time interval has to be less than zero. So we look at our graph for bare A, and we need to find a point on the graph, or an area on the graph, where, like we said, delta x over some time interval delta t is less than zero, and that happens right about here. He's going backwards in position. Up here his position is around 2000, and back here his position is around 1400. So, is the velocity of the bear A always positive? No, because at this area, the velocity is negative. The next part of the question asks, is the velocity of bear B ever negative? So we look at the graph of bear B, and like we said, we need to find some delta x um, over some time interval, delta t, or sorry, we need to find some time interval, delta t, where delta x is less than zero. So, is there any point, and a, a, an easier way to explain that is when is the graph going downwards? So, and we look at this graph, and it doesn't, it's not really going downwards anywhere, so the, veloc the velocity of bear B is never negative. The next question is page 47, question 5, which reads, An athlete swims from the north end to the south end of a pool, a 50 meter pool in 20 seconds. He makes the return trip in 22 seconds. So the first thing we want to do is draw our pool. It's always good to draw something to visualize. Draw, and then draw something to represent the times. So part A of the question asks, what is the average velocity for the first half of the swim? So average velocity equals change in distance over change in time, which equals 50.0 meters over 20.0 seconds. And if you divide that on your calculator or in your head, you will get 2.5 meters per second for the first half of the swim. Part B asks, what is the average velocity for the second half of the swim? Again, delta x, delta t, it's always good to write out the formula, the general formula you're using first, instead of just going straight to plugging in numbers. Uh, usually on free response questions on quizzes and tests, the general formula will at least get you partial credit. So for the second half of the swim, it's the same distance on the way back, this arrow. It's going to be 50.0 meters in 22.0 seconds. And if you divide that on your calculator, you will get 2. 3 or 2.27 meters per second. So that's 2.27 meters per second. Now part C is a little tricky. Part C asks, what is the average velocity for the round trip? So average velocity, like we've been saying, is change in x over change in time. Now you'd be inclined to think the change in x is 50 meters plus 50 meters. But if we think of this as our starting point, then this way we'll call the positive direction, and this way we'll call the negative direction. So if we went 50 meters down in the positive direction, and then 50 meters back in the negative direction, then wouldn't our total displacement be 0 meters? Yes, it would. So then the answer to what is the average velocity for the round trip, it's going to be 0 over the sum of those times, but it doesn't really matter, is 42.0 seconds, so it's going to just be zero. Now the reason for that, again, is because from the, the starting point to the finish point, your position hasn't changed. Yes, you went down and back, but you're still at the same point. So that's why your average velocity is zero. The next question is question two on page 69. The question asks, on a position time graph such as figure 2-18, what represents the velocity? And this is figure 2-18.
So velocity on a position versus time graph is going to be the slope of the graph. We'll, we'll use m to represent our slope, and I'll explain why. So usually, you calculate slope as rise over run, which is equal to change in y over change in x. But in this case, our in this case, our graph, the y value is position, and the x value is time. Now normally, so we'll call it change in position over change in time, which is the same thing as average velocity. Now, a little thing to note. So far in this video, I've called v average change in x over change in time. Now, Something to be aware of is that this x is not this x. While this may be the x-axis, it does not. The variable on it in physics is almost always going to be time, which is t. And your change in x is your displacement, which is usually represented on the y-axis. It's strange, but go with it. So that's why your slope is your average velocity, or just velocity. Actually, it doesn't necessarily have to be average. The next question is on page 69, number 3. The question says, sketch a position time graph for each of the following situations. A, an object at rest. That looks like a D. A, an object at rest. So for an object at rest, once a position versus time graph, and an object at rest means over time as time goes on the position is not changing so you could have a position of 5 and have it not change and that's an object at rest because as time goes on the object doesn't move part b asks you to sketch the position versus time graph for an object with a constant positive velocity constant positive velocity means constant slope so the graph would look like this or this or this. Any straight line. But it has to be positive. It cannot be negative. Part C asks for an object with a constant negative velocity. And that would be this. So for an object with a constant negative velocity, you could draw it like this, or like this, or like this. As long as the slope of the line is negative, the velocity is negative. Question 4 on page 69 says, The position versus time graph for a bug crawling along a line is shown in figure 2-19. That's this drawing. Determine whether the velocity is positive, negative, or zero at each of the times marked on the graph. At time 1, if you hold something tangent to the graph, it points downward, meaning the velocity at that point is negative. At time 2, if you hold something tangent to the graph, it points upward, meaning the velocity is positive. At time 3, if you hold something tangent to the graph, it st still points upwards, meaning the velocity is st still positive. At time 4, if you hold something tangent, it points downwards, meaning the velocity is negative. And at time 5, if you hold something tangent to the graph, it, it actually points flat, meaning the velocity, or change in position over change in time, is zero because the position is not changing at that point in time. Question 5 says, use the position versus time graph in figure 2-19 to answer the following questions. Part A. During which time intervals is the velocity decreasing? So for a decreasing velocity, the velocity has to be going from positive to negative. The first time we see that starts at time t equals 3 and ends at time t equals 4. Because at time t equals 4, while the velocity is negative, it starts to level out, meaning it's going from negative to zero, which is actually an increase. So the only time when the velocity is decreasing is from t equals 3, or t3, to t4. Part b asks, during which time intervals is the velocity increasing? For, lo for the velocity incre to be increasing, it has to start negative and go positive. At the very beginning of the graph, it is negative and continues to turn positive until time t equals 3, at which point it becomes negative again. So the interval, so one interval for which the velocity is decreasing is 0 to t equals 3. 
However, we haven't looked past t equals 4. At t equals 4, the velocity starts to increase, as I already explained. The next question, number 9 on page 69, says, If you live 10 kilometers from your school and the bus takes 0.53 hours to reach the school, driving due east, what is the average velocity of the bus? Again, the best way to do it is to draw up a, pic draw up a picture. So we'll call this school, we'll call this home, draw a line, 10 kilometers, and it wants to know your average velocity. Now, again, average velocity is change in distance over change in time, which for this problem, which for this problem would be 10 kilometers, because that's the difference between your home and the school, over the change in time, which is 0.53 hours. If you plug that into your calculator and round, you will get 19 kilometers per hour. However, a velocity, velocity is a vector, and vectors have direction and magnitude. So far, we only have a magnitude. The direction is due east, as stated in the problem. So the, tr the whole answer is 17 kilometers per hour east. Question 10 says, figure 20-2 is the position versus time graph for a squirrel running along a clothesline. Part A asks, what is a squirrel's displacement during the time interval t equals 0 to t equals 3 seconds? Displacement is calculated as the position at time equals 3 seconds minus the position at time equals 0 seconds. The position at 3 seconds can be read off the graph as negative 2 meters. Similarly, the position at 0 seconds can be read off the graph as 0 meters. Therefore, the change in position, the, cha uh, the squirrel's displacement from time equals 0 to time equals 3 is negative 2. And our unit can be read off the y-axis is meters. Part B asks, what is the squirrel's average velocity during this time interval? The average, or the average velocity, can be calculated as delta x over delta t. Delta x is the, dis is the displacement which we just calculated as negative 2 meters. And the time is the change and the change in time from 0 to 3 seconds is 3 seconds. So the average velocity is equal to negative 0.68 meters per second. Sorry. Negative 0.67 meters per second. Question 13 says Sally travels by car from one city to another. She drives for 30 minutes at 80 kilometers per hour. Sorry, 80 kilometers per hour. 12 minutes at 105 kilometers per hour and 45 minutes at 40 kilometers per hour. It also says that she spends 15 minutes eating lunch and buying gas which can be represented as 15 minutes at zero kilometers per hour. Now, part A tells you to determine the average speed for the trip. Part B tells you to determine the total distance traveled. However, I think this is a stupid question. And part B should be first because determining the total distance traveled is part of calculating the average speed for the trip, or at least the easiest way I know how to. Now, to calculate the total distance traveled, which is the first thing we're going to do, we're going to multiply each individual velocity by the time it was traveled. However, first, we need to convert all these times into hours so we can multiply them by the velo velocities. So, 30 minutes is equal to 0.5 hours. 12 minutes. Now, this one's a little harder to do in your head, so you multiply it by 60 minutes per one hour, and you get 0.2 hours. 45 minutes is 
same strategy, dimensional analysis, 45 minutes is 0.75 hours, and 15 minutes is equal to 0.25 hours. Now, we now need to multiply each of these individual times by the by the velocity that they were traveled at. So, multiply 80 by 0.5 hours, the hours 0.5 over 1 hours, the hours cancel, and we get 40 kilometers. So what this means is by traveling 80 kilometers per hour for 30 minutes, she went 40 kilometers. Now we need to find all the rest of these and add them up to find our total distance traveled. So 105 kilometers per hour for 12 minutes is 105 times 0.2 hours over 1. Hours cancel and we get 20... 21 kilometers. So again, this means that by traveling 105 kilometers per hour in 12 minutes, she went 21 kilometers. Again, continuing this method, 4.75 hours for 1, 1, we get 30 kilometers, and 15 minutes at 0 kilometers per hour, obviously times 0.25, it's going to be 0 kilometers. So our total distance is 40 plus 21 plus 30 plus 0 kilometers per hour, which adds up to 91 kilometers. Now, to find the average speed for the trip, we need to take the total distance over the total time. Now, the total distance is 91 kilometers. The total, dis the total time is... 0.5 hours plus 0.2 hours plus 0.75 hours plus 0.25 hours, which adds up to 1.7 hours. If we divide these on our calculator, we get 53.5 kilometers per hour. Part B asks, determine the total distance traveled, which we already found out was 91 kilometers. Question 17 on page 70 says, runner A is initially 0.6 kilometers west of a flagpole. So we'll call our flagpole F, and we'll put runner A over here, and we'll represent this as 6 kilometers. Runner A is initially 6 kilometers west of a flagpole, and is running with a constant velocity of 9.8 kilometers per hour due east. Now, for those of us who don't remember, compass, north, east, south, west. So he's running this way, at 9 kilometers per hour. Runner B is initially 5 kilometers east of the flagpole and is running with a constant velocity of 8 kilometers per hour. Hmm. That's longer than that, isn't it? Well, pretend that that's longer than that. It's just a picture. And the question asks, how far are the runners from the flagpole when their paths cross? Now, the best way to think about this problem, imagine if you're driving. If you're going on the freeway, and you're going 65 miles per hour, and someone else is coming towards you at 65 miles an hour, how fast are you really approaching each other? Well, if you imagine that that person is stationary, you're actually approaching at each other at 65 plus 65 miles per hour, which is 130 miles per hour. So, if we apply this to this problem, these two runners are running towards each other at 9 plus 8 kilometers per hour, which is 17 kilometers per hour. Also, they are 11 kilometers apart. Now, the first thing we need to figure out is how long it took runner A to get to runner B. 
So the way we're treating this problem is as if runner B is stationary, even though they're both moving. It's the same way you would treat a driving problem if two cars are headed towards each other at the same speed, uh, then their speeds are doubled, and you can treat one of them as stationary. So to get to time, we need 11 kilometers times 1 hour over 17 kilometers, which gives us 0.65 hours. Now, we have the time it took the two runners to run into each other, but it wants to know how far the runners were from the flagpole when their paths cross. So, to figure this out, we plug this time back into either of these two speeds. Let's pick this one. To get the distance traveled by runner A, so we multiplied the velocity of runner A by the time he traveled before he hit runner B, and we get the distance traveled before he hit runner B, which is 5.8 kilometers. Now, to figure out the distance between runner A and the flagpole when runner A hit runner B, we subtract this, this number, the distance it took, the distance runner A ran before runner A came into contact with runner B, so we subtract that number from 6. And we get 0.2 kilometers. So runner A was 0.2 kilometers west, that way, of the flagpole when he hit runner B. So then our answer is 0.2 kilometers west. Thank you for watching this episode of PHS Physics SOS. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments of the YouTube video, or hopefully I will have a Facebook page up by then, and I will link the Facebook page, and you can ask questions there, and I will be available on Skype to help people individually who still need it.